All right, it looks like we've got the uh, recording in, in progress, so we're going to go ahead and jump, jump in and get started here. Uh, my name is Ben Shackman. I'm the uh, Midwest Regional Manager here at Triple Point Environmental, and what that means is that places like this, now let's get this next slide, places like this, there we go, are places that I don't generally get to see too terribly much of. Uh, slides are a little bit laggy. We'll wait and uh, make sure that that's all right for everybody. So uh, as I as I give these presentations, I like to begin with a uh, a quick agenda. And very typically, the first thing on any agenda that I use is going to be a why do we care? Now, very simply, very simply put, why is this important? How does this impact our lives? You know, why, why should I pay attention to this? And beyond that, we're going to talk about the uh, different types of biological processes. We're going to get into setting the stage for treatment, looking at a couple of different parameters and how they how they impact uh, microbiology and you know how they need to be in, in line. Uh, we're going to dig into uh, the food web a little bit. We're going to be talking at a macro level through uh, microbiology and the food web. And we're going to narrow that down a little bit and start to look at the bacteria, heterotrophs and autotrophs. And, That'll pivot directly into a conversation of, uh, of nitrification and denitrification. And we're going to follow that by a deeper dive into what's in your pond and look at specifically at some of the bugs that, that may or may not be living in your pond. And folks, I think it's really important to note that people go out and they get PhDs in microbi microbiology. Uh, I can't possibly give a doctoral level examination of all of the microorganisms tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different microorganisms that could be in the pond. So instead, this is an overview. We're going to look a lot at the situations, the uh, the dependencies, the, the synergies, if you will, how these organisms exist together, how they complement one another, and how they work together in order to do the work we need, the, uh, the digestion of the waste. We'll get into respiration versus fermentation. That's all about where the energy comes from to, to fire these, these microbial processes, to fuel them. Uh, we're gonna circle back and review the five critical factors required for a lagoon to work properly. And I'll uh, have a slide on Lagoon University in the event anyone out there is behind on PDHs and CEUs. And I'm gonna try to reserve just a little bit of time at the end for some questions. And we're gonna jump right in now. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm looking at my audience view, and that's still a little bit laggy. Let, let me let me try to get to the next slide. All right. So why do we care? Uh, it, it's hard to do better than uh, than you know what's written in Metcalfinetti as far as an explanation. Uh, so this is a direct quote out of Metcalfinetti. The overall objectives of biological treatment of domestic wastewater are two. Oxidized, dissolved, and particulate biodegradable constituents, that's the waste, into acceptable end products, that's the effluent. So we're using microbiology to chew through the waste and create an acceptable effluent. Uh, capturing and incorporating suspended non settleable collateral solids into a biological flock or biofilm, that applies a little bit more in activated sludge or mechanical plants than it does to lagoon treatment, but it, it, that same concept is still in place. The notion of, uh, of, of organic material, um, products of digestion, uh, settling and forming a sludge layer. We see that in lagoons. Transformation of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah, that's going on constantly. I mean, that's just BioP and, and uh, nitrification and denitrification. And in some cases, removing specific trace organic constituents and compounds. I'd love to be able to trace something like hexavalent chrome all the way through the treatment process and demonstrate how it gets chewed on or doesn't. Um, unfortunately, that isn't really the scope of, of our presentation for lagoons. What is the scope of our presentation is looking at biological treatment and how important it is. And folks, I'll tell you that the, you know, the, this statement, the most efficient way of removing soluble compounds from wastewater, that, that's not just Ben's opinion. That's uh, you know, straight out of a study in the Journal of Applied Energy. Now, this was a few years ago, and they looked at uh, different technologies, and they concluded that lagoons consume the least amount of kilowatt hours to treat a cubic meter of wastewater and produce the least amount of greenhouse gases at the same time. 
it's hard to beat that. It's more efficient than an ox ditch or a, an activated sludge process or something like that. And that's great. It's the mechanism of lagoon treatment. We're not talking phys chem. We're talking microbial digestion. And you have CBOD that's converted to CO2, carbonaceous biochemical oxygen demand that gets converted to you know, carbon dioxide, allows for true removal with minimal waste. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And that's what we see in our sludge blanket is the little bit of waste. So folks looking at different types of aerobic biological processes, and this presentation is focused on aerobic as opposed to anaerobic. Different types of aerobic processes. On the left side, suspended growth. Things like activated sludge, these lagoons, uh, membrane bioreactors. Over on the right, there's an acronym that adds another B, and it's a whole lot different. A uh, MBBR, a uh, moving bed biofilm reactor, is a whole lot different type of treatment process than a membrane bioreactor. RBCs, trickling filters, we find those as attached growth, attached growth processes or treatment processes. And then a hybrid. An example of a hybrid would be IFAS, integrated fixed film, activated sludge. And folks, I'll just tell you the biggest difference between an IFAS and an MBBR is the RAS. IFAS has RAS. You're, you're bringing those solids back around. You're creating a mixed liquor suspended, an MLSS, a mixed liquor. Not the same in MBBRs. MBBRs, any solids are just wasted. And folks, I said we're going we're gonna to start out, we're going to be talking about setting the stage. And let's look at a couple of different parameters. So establishing the right conditions in terms of temperature and pH. And wait a minute, hold on now. Those top bullets are the same on both. Optimal growth in a narrow range, survival in a broader range. That, that isn't a whole lot different than human beings, is it? You know, we, we can survive in a much broader temperature range. Uh, than we like. We can survive with more or less food than we like. Any of these parameters can be more or less. Microorganisms are not that different. They can live in a much broader range than where they do really, really, really well. Worth noting that temperature, especially low temperature, has a more significant impact than higher temperature. And folks, it, it's, it's pretty well known that the bugs will grow two times faster for each additional 10 degrees centigrade that you provide until the optimal temperature is reached. So every organism has a different optimal temperature. Every, every microorganism does. Let's assume that you know bug A grows really, really well. Their optimal temperature, 28 degrees Celsius. Now, if you've got eight degrees coming into your pond and you have the ability to warm that water up somehow, you could actually uh, double and then double again the uh, microbial activity rate to get up to that 28C. On the pH side, it's a little different. You can see four to nine and a half is pretty typically the range where these microorganisms live and, and exist and thrive. But optimal is much narrower, much narrower, down around six and a half to seven and a half pH. And that's a great segue into the next slide. And we're gonna talk about pH. It, it's, it's very simply defined as potential hydrogen or potential of hydrogen and it's a log scale. So pH is the measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution and reflects its relative acidity or basicity. And just a quick reminder, those ions we're talking about are carbonate, bicarbonate, and hydroxide. Those are the three forms of alkalinity. And it's important to note that, you know, seven is neutral and above seven is basic or, or caustic, or it's a base. Below seven is acidic all the way down to zero. And the scale is zero to 14. You're gonna see two different interpretations of the scale in later slides. The right answer is zero is the acid line, the very base acid line. And you actually can see negative numbers in, in extreme environments, where 14 is the top number on, on, the, uh, on the basicity. And uh, you're just becoming more and more alkaline as the number approaches 14. Municipal wastewater is usually pretty close to neutral, and the pH in a wastewater lagoon system is incredibly variable. Folks, if you go out and you take a measurement of your pH before the sun rises, go back to that same spot, same depth, take another measurement at solar noon when the sun's at its highest point in the sky, you will have taken these readings six or eight hours apart, but they won't look anything the same. You will have completely different readings. And that's at the same spot. 
you can see a variation in pH spatially across the lagoon. That means that the northeast corner may have a different pH than the center of the pond, and the southwest corner may be in a different, may be in a different number altogether. It's not at all uncommon. And folks, in order to kind of help understand pH and where it is and how we experience pH as humans, uh, I've got this chart for you. So if you happen to erp a little bit after lunch, that nasty taste in your, in your mouth, that's gastric juices at about a pH of two. Tomato juice is less acidic and pure water we see in the middle there. Uh, human blood at 7.4, hand soap at 10. Hand soap, there's a caustic component to the soaps that are used to clean us and it, it raises the pH. And sodium hypochlorite is not household bleach. Household bleach is a dilute version of it. And that's why household bleach is coming in at 12 when sodium hypochlorite, the full strength stuff, would be at a higher pH. But it's hazardous, it's a hazardous pH. So what we buy for household bleach is actually a made down product. It's a dilute product. Still shows a pH of 12, but yeah, that's a dilute product when we're talking about talking about uh, bleach. And folks, this is a good, good opportunity to pause and talk a little bit about that log scale and what does that really mean? So look at a pH of nine. A pH of nine is going to be 10 times more basic than a pH of eight. Likewise, a pH of five would be 10 times more acidic than a pH of six. So you've got a, a log scale, a great amount of movement represented in each standard unit that you move along the scale. And folks, as we look at another version of this scale here, we're looking at setting the stage as far as pH is concerned. We can see typical range for a lagoon, we can see ideal for BOD, and then a more restrictive range is ideal for nitrification. This is just simply about different bugs having different requirements. What they need, want, and desire changes. It's variable by the microorganism. And folks, what we're going to talk about next is how you build a bug. What's the recipe? What are the ingredients? What do we need to have present in order for life to, to exist and thrive? And here's the recipe. Uh, so we see carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, phosphorus, and then other stuff in smaller amounts. That's a whole pile of different things. And when we look to ratios to better understand when a pond is in balance or out of balance, we're looking very typically at the ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus. 100 to 5 to 1 is a starting point that we use. And if you've got 100 to 5 to 1, you are setting the stage. You have the right building blocks to start to create some bugs. And these bugs fall into three main categories, if you will. Photosynthesizers like algae, uh, purple sulfur bacteria, and you know some plants. They're using sunlight and photosynthesis. You have the heterotrophic bacteria in the ponds expelling CO2. Uh, the photosynthesizers take that in, and you know they also assimilate some nitrogen, some phosphorus, and they produce oxygen as their byproduct. The decomposers are doing a different job for us. They're cons consuming, excuse me, consuming the constituents of, of BOD and they're producing CO2. So what is BOD? Very simply, it's any organic material that enters your pond. The vast majority of it comes through your collection system. Some of it falls off of or out of wildlife in and around your pond. And some of it just simply falls out of the sky or gets blown into your pond. It's all biochemical oxygen demand. It exerts, a, it exerts an oxygen demand on the microorganisms in the pond, the decomposers specifically. And then the predators are next. And, uh, you know, our, our friend, and I spotted this gentleman in uh, March out of Kansas Rural Water, our friend Ricky Bobby would say, if you ain't first, you're last. He's one of the more competitive ones out there, I think. He's competitive like the protozoa, the rotifers, the daphnia, nematodes. These are organisms that are consuming lower life forms. And as they're doing it, they're reducing turbidity. These lower life forms, these bacteria, the heterotrophs that float freely in the water column, if you can see it or filter it, it represents TSS. It's a suspended solid if you can see it or filter it. The predators. The protozoa, the rotifers, the daphnia, the nematodes, they're chewing, they're chewing these things up. They're eating those bugs also. And interestingly enough, in addition to reducing turbidity, 
the act of predation, the fact that one organism in the pond is preying on another, actually stimulates microbial growth as a response in the prey organism. So you see a greater population density of, of, of those bugs when they're being eaten, when they're being chased around, you get more of them. And folks, that's a, a really light introduction to the concept of a food web, but that's where we're going next. And a food web is, is very simply, there we go, the screen caught up. So we have the influent on the left and we have the effluent on the right. And you can tell that this isn't one of uh, triple points diagrams because there are these horribly inefficient surface aerators out there and they're not reaching the bottom. And so we're, we're establishing, it. when I say they're not reaching the bottom, I'm talking about their, their patterns and how they oxygenate. So a true pond will set up as aerobic, the area that's getting oxygen, either from mechanical aeration or transfer across the liquid air interface or, or uh, oxygenation via algal activity. That's all taking place up towards the top of the water column. You get further down, down around a half a part of oxygen, half a milligram per liter DO. We describe that as anoxic and then all the way down at the bottom of the pond where there's little to no oxygen available, little to no DO at all. That's in the anaerobic zone. And you've got a lot going on down there just at a completely different speed. So we see the influent, it's composites, it's all sorts of stuff. It's the Big Mac that you had for lunch. It's the ammonia, it's all of the soluble and inorganic material and it all shows up in the pond. And there are literally tens of thousands of different microorganisms just sitting there waiting for it with their mouths open. And they're all interrelated. And what one is doing impacts another. And the waste product from one organism becomes the food source of another. It helps to build the cellular structure. It protects. It's just phenomenal how interrelated all of these things are in the ponds. These are beautiful little science experiments. And at the end of the day, we're, we're flowing an effluent that's in not terribly bad condition. It's ready to be discharged to the environment. So talking about what's going on inside of the food web, you have bacteria eating organic matter, the protozoa are eating the bacteria, and the higher life forms come along to eat those protozoa. All of them are oxygen-fueled organisms, and the algae is helping create the oxygen necessary for aerobic processes. And folks, I love this. Uh, Steve Harris is one of our one of our favorite guys, one of our best friends. He has a book out, uh, Wastewater Lagoon Troubleshooting. It's an excellent desk site reference. Can't recommend it highly enough. But Steve writes in, the, in his book that organisms reflect their food source. And I think that that's a great way to put it. You know, you look at what's coming in in the waste products off of a municipal system and compare that to a distillery or a sugar beet or sugar beet producer or an aerospace, aerospace plant. And they're all going to have different flow and loading, different constituents, different organic inorganics, different pHs, different temperatures. It's all going to be completely different. And as a result, you're going to grow completely different bugs. Each one of those systems is its own little science experiment in terms of the microbiology growing in the ponds. But more than that, the type and the quantity is going to vary by location, depth, and influent characteristics. Put simply, you are going to find different bugs in the north in the northeast corner than you do the southwest corner. And you know, at three feet of depth, it's gonna be a different soup than you find at seven or eight feet of depth or up at the surface. It's gonna be variable across your pond. It's gonna vary by day, time of day, month, season, lots and lots and lots of variability. But what's true and what remains constant is that, you know, these are nature's self-purification mechanisms. You have one organism consuming the waste of another. We talked about uh, microbial digestion, the heterotrophic bacteria expelling CO2, lowers the pH. Algae consumes the CO2, releases O2, normalizes pH, and provides fuel, the oxygen that those heterotrophs that expel the CO and CO2 in the first place need. Absolutely interrelated. And each type of microbe, every single one of these little suckers, has a function to perform in nature. And it's natural to find overlap. And what we find, what we find in the overlap is that the organism that predominates, the organism that excels, is going to be the organism that has the closest match to its ideal conditions. 
in terms of temperature, pH, food source, availability of the food, solubility of the food, whole predation, you know, what's trying to eat it. All of these different things matter. And you may have six or eight or a hundred different bugs that can eat the same molecule, but the one that survives, the one that grows the fastest, that thrives, that takes over the pond, is going to be the one that most closely resembles, the, the conditions most closely resemble that microorganism's ideal conditions. The other ones are going to taper off and possibly die out. And this is just because wastewater is incredibly complex. And everything that I just said, if the, if the influent looks different tomorrow, so will the bugs. If it looks different in the afternoon, so will the bugs. But, you know, one of the biggest benefits, some of the biggest benefits of a well-functioning food web, odors are mitigated and controlled and nutrients kept low and sludge volume. You know, you've got a calculated value. You know how, how fast you're supposed to accumulate sludge. And, you know, when you've got a well-functioning food web, your sludge accumulation looks like that calculated rate. You know, pathogens, E. coli, fecal coliform, you know, we talked about how those are microorganisms floating in the water column and subject to predation by higher organisms. Getting those reduced to permanent levels is important, and the food web, food web helps to do that. The water is oxygenated and stable, and the turbidity is low. It's not cloudy. It doesn't look like tea. It doesn't look like pea soup. It looks like clear water. And that says, you know, we're, we're in good shape. We're probably not going to negatively impact the receiving stream. And if we keep algae down, then we don't have a whole lot to worry about as far as downstream algal blooms or fish kills or, uh, you know, eutrophication caused by low DO water being released and, you know, cratering a, 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 a fish hatchery or something like that. No, Let, let's keep our microbiology nicely balanced. Let's promote the right conditions. To do that, let's grow the right bugs in the right proportions and let's achieve all of these benefits of a well-functioning food web. When we do that, we're using microbiology to our advantage. And folks, we're going to dig into the microbiology a little bit more right now. We're going to start talking heterotrophs and autotrophs. Heterotrophs are getting carbon from organic sources. They eat organic molecules and yeah, they, they will eat other microbes. The autotrophs are a completely different story. These little guys require CO2 or another carbon source. Uh, they can make chemical energy through chemosynthesis, and some of them, not all, algae especially, is using sunlight for photosynthesis. And continuing the conversation about heterotrophs versus autotrophs, the heterotrophs are chewing through the BOD, while the autotrophs are specifically, as we're talking nitrifiers, we're talking nitrosominus, nitrospira, and nitrobacter. Our, our heterotrophs, the BOD eaters, they're faster, stronger, and hungrier. They outcompete the autotrophs time and time again. And they can float freely in the water column. That gives them a lot of flexibility. Where the nitrifiers are slow to grow, they're weak, they don't compete very well, and they're attached growth organisms. So what that means is that these guys, they, they excrete a chemical compound and they attach themselves to whatever surface. They need something to stick to in the pond. They cannot just float freely in the water column like most of the heterotrophs. They've got to grab hold of something and they're going to stay attached to that for their entire lifespan. And folks, what they're grabbing hold of, that can be riprap, that can be rocks in the bottom of your pond, that's any, anything that you installed, any aeration equipment, any hoses, any laterals. If you've got a baffle in your pond, you'll find them growing there. If you have, you know, incomplete uh, pre-treatment and you get applicators and plastics in your pond, grab one of them, throw it under a microscope. If you see a real thin, light, light-colored, filmy layer, you're probably looking at nitrifiers. If it's thick and mucusy and slimy and looks like snot, those are heterotrophs. But attached growth organisms, they are a completely different microorganism with completely different needs. And we can see that very, very clearly when we start to look at the pounds of oxygen required to oxidize a pound of BOD, pretty well understood to be somewhere between one and a half and two pounds. But there's not a lot of conversation or discussion. 4.6 pounds per pound is pretty well recognized as, as what our nitrifying bacteria need as far as an oxygen supply. You see completely different DO setups in how we set a system up to run for BOD removal as opposed to when we're removing ammonia. 
And as we can see, the microbial community requires a whole lot more oxygen to nitrify than it does to, to treat BOD. And that last bullet there, providing extra oxygen is just extra expense. I, I'm fond of saying that when I go out for pizza by myself, I don't order the 16 inch. I'm not trying to bring home three days of leftovers at restaurant prices. I wanna spend the least amount possible for my pizza and I can make something out of the fridge the other days. Extra oxygen is no different. The exception is nobody gets a benefit of it. It's an extra, it's a residual. It's, it's more than is needed. The bugs have consumed everything that they need to consume in order to get to your residual. And everything is just, everything in that residual and everything above that residual is just excess. And folks, I've got a quick, quick graphic here. Uh, just a quick reminder that only about 21% of the air that we breathe is oxygen. This is at sea level. And approximately 78% of it is nitrogen. I'll, I'll ask you to keep that in mind. That's, that's going to come up again in a, in a later part of the presentation. But as we continue our conversation about nitrification versus denitrification, uh, we can see nitrification on the left side there. We've got NH4 being reduced to nitrite, and then nitrate uh, gets shifted over. So we've got we've got autotrophic bacteria accomplishing denitrification for us, but excuse me, accomplishing nitrification. Those are autotrophs. Denitrification are the heterotrophic bacteria. And folks, you've heard me say nitrosominus, nitrospera, nitrobacter a few times already. You haven't, you haven't heard me rattle off a whole bunch of names of, of the heterotrophs. I haven't said anything about azotobacter or acinetobacter or anything like that. But I've got a nice laundry list here for you. I'll come up on the screen in a second. And there are a whole lot more heterotrophic bacteria involved in denitrification than we find autotrophic bacteria involved in nitrification. A uh, source coming up on the screen here is Girardi's book. If you need a good desk side reference for microbiology to understand the bugs and what's going on in your ponds, that's my favorite and I keep it on my desk. So as we're talking nitrification, we're talking prim primarily nitrosomus, nitrospera, nitrobacter. These are autotrophs, they're attached growth organisms and they're easily outcompeted by heterotrophs. And after that comma, you see here, need low BOD to flourish. Well, wait a minute, what does that mean? That means very simply that if you look at all of the companies that are producing tertiary treatment systems for nitrification, you'll find that we're all putting them pretty far back in the process. We don't want a bunch of heterotrophs in our, in our process. We really and truly want to preference the autotrophic bacteria. In order to do that, we look to treat down to a basically discharge level for BOT. If we can remove the food source, we can get rid of the heterotrophs as, as an active participant in that tertiary treatment process. We don't want to be treating BOD at the end of the process. We want to be polishing ammonia. I say we, this is common to every, every one of my competitors, every one of our competitors. We all need a lower BOD entering water condition in order to get good nitrification to occur without a lot of heterotrophic activity and interference. So it's important to note that nitrification will slow and stop at high temperatures up at about 40 C, you see it discontinued, and also at low temperatures. And conventional wisdom says that's five degrees Celsius. There, there's a body of research, we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes that shows some slightly different numbers, but. If you wanna see a completely different answer, hit Lagoon University and check out nitrification in cold weather. And you can see how these, uh, how these organisms, nitrosomonas, nitrospera, and nitrobacter, we have data in that presentation down to half a degree Celsius. Theoretically impossible. We've been doing it for years and it's changing conventional wisdom. We'll talk a little bit more on that in a couple of minutes. We're gonna keep going with nitrification for now. So I, I don't want you to be confused by the bullet about energy metabolism. Nitrification requires more energy than BOD consumption. It's just lower energy metabolism when you look at the whole spectrum of, of what cellular activity consumes. Uh, so they need alkalinity as a carbon source and it's 7.1 parts of alkalinity per part of TKM. And it's, it's really wild to see an alkalinity deficiency in, in the field. Uh, it presents as a, uh, as a plateau. Nitrification continues until the alkalinity is consumed and then it just plateaus. 
It could plateau at seven milligrams per liter. It could plateau at one milligram per liter. But you're not achieving complete nitrification if you don't have sufficient alkalinity present. 7.1 to 1 is the ratio. And then you need a whole lot more oxygen also in order to support that nitrification process. It's calculated as 4.6 pounds of oxygen per pound of TKM. And then folks over on the right is the redox tower. And that just provides a visualization of energy that can be transferred. The bigger the gap between the molecules, the more powerful the reaction. Also, the higher up on the tower, the greater the tendency to donate or release electrons, while the lower on the tower, the greater tendency is to receive those donated electrons. And as we continue the conversation, it's time to talk about denitrification now. And looking at denitrification, it's a completely different story. We need anoxic conditions to force those heterotrophs, that laundry list of heterotrophs we saw, to source oxygen from nitrate, that NO3 instead of the DO that's so readily available so many places in our systems. We don't want that if we're going to denitrify. We've got to get rid of all that DO. If we can get to a half a part, we can denitrify, but we'll do better if we're down at 0.2 milligrams per liter. Optimal pH of seven to eight and a half, but it's important to note that these, these bugs stop working at a less than 6.8 on the pH. That carbon source for growth is, is a requirement. We talked about that on the last slide and how we're looking to eliminate that carbon source upstream in order to ensure we're growing autotrophs, not heterotrophs. Now we're back to heterotrophs, so we're, we're looking to grow and we need, some, we need a carbon source for them. And folks, they're producing alkalinity where the process of nitrification destroys alkalinity or consumes alkalinity at a rate of 7.1 parts per part. Over here in denitrification, these different bugs are producing alkalinity. We're producing 3.57 grams per gram of nitrate that gets converted to M2, to nitrogen. So it, nitrate, what is nitrate? It, it's a molecule that has one nitrogen and three oxygens attached to it. That's its structure. And these heterotrophic bacteria, when they're, salt, when they're starving for oxygen and they can't find the DO that they want in the water, they'll instead nip an oxygen off of the nitrate. So you nip those three ox oxygens off of that nitrate molecule. Now you've just got an N, it's negatively charged. Two of them come together and that's N2, that's nitrogen gas. It gets harmlessly off gas to atmosphere. And folks, if you think back to the slide that I showed earlier where I made the point that extra air is just an extra expense and that's wasteful, you may remember that 78% of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen gas. There is no problem whatsoever to, is up to off gas all the nitrogen gas that you need to to complete the conversion of nitrogen to this harmless nitrogen gas. No, no problem with that whatsoever. And folks, I, I'm, I'm changing gears a little bit. We're going deeper. We're going to talk a little bit more about the microbial soup. And the microbial soup is made up, again, of, of a whole bunch of different bugs, a whole bunch of different organisms, photosynthesizers, decomposers, predators being the main categories. And as we continue on, we see uh, BOD consuming bacteria next. Heterotrophs, by definition, these guys are consuming food found in their environment. It either showed up in the collection system, it fell off of or out of a higher life form in the pond or around the pond, it fell out of the sky. Regardless, it needs to be consumed. And the three common types of heterotrophs that do this for us are free floating. And you may remember earlier, I said that if you can see it or filter it, it's TSS, it's, a, it's total suspended solids. So free floating represent TSS, those bugs do. Flock forming or flocculated bacteria and then filamentous. And filamentous bacteria are a lot more of a concern in activated sludge than they are for lagoons. They result typically from low DO, low FM ratio, low pH, et cetera. Uh, but where they become interesting is that they're an indicator organism. And you can, you can see filamentous starting to form as DO gets critically low. Uh, it's an indicator organism. Their presence indicates something else is taking place. Collectively, the heterotrophs are diverse, fast reproducing, and you know the time to generate new microorganisms for heterotrophs ranges from minutes to hours, and it's not a surprise then that most have a lifespan of just about two days. 
They're, they're known as uh, saprophytes because they live on dead and decaying organic material. Uh, that's anything in the collection system. It's that Big Mac that got flushed after lunch. And yeah, that's that's what they're feeding on. And you know, many varieties, they're able to adapt quickly. Specific populations change. This is that whole idea that you don't have a static population. It is always in flux. It is always changing. It is very dynamic in nature, and it's going to change based on what's going on, what, what stressors it's exposed to. And yeah, the bug you have today that's doing great work for you won't be the bug doing great work for you tomorrow if you've got different conditions. And folks over on the right-hand side, that's courtesy of Loyola University in Chicago, that's a sporodium at a thousand times magnification. And that particular bug's presence in a, in a sample would suggest septicity. And there are human pathogens in this family that cause Lyme disease and syphilis. So the same bugs that we're finding in the wastewater are related to the bugs that are creating problems for humans. And uh, we're going to look next at some anaerobic bacteria. We're going to talk a little bit about sludge reducing bacteria and what's going on down in the anaerobic section of the pond, down where there's no oxygen. So this presentation is geared towards aerobic bacteria, but it is important to consider the anaerobes also because they're, they're important to the lagoon operator too. Sludge reducing bacteria are, are anaerobic in nature based on the lack of DO down at the bottom of the pond. And they do continue to digest settled solids. You know, there, there are those out there that think that the sludge is just dead. It, it's not, it's a living thing too. It's full of living things. They're just being, they're digesting that organic material at a very, very slow rate. So slow that we wind up doing sludge abatement as opposed to waiting it out. You get a dredge out or something like that and you mechanically remove the sludge. We've got acid producers, producers, methane producers, sulfate reducing bacteria. Those are the guys producing H2S. Methane stinks also. And I think it's important to note that these are the bad kids in class here that we're talking about now. They're probably getting in trouble for smoking behind the gym. They're making your pond stink. And if someone's calling you to complain about your wastewater lagoons, it's probably due to the activities of anaerobic bacteria. So the, the good that they do, they do reduce sludge and they pull the total BOD down some, but at a very, very slow rate. And you know, floating sludge, seasonal turnover, odor problems, off-gassing, yeah, these are all issues that, that uh, sludge reducing bacteria create. And folks, if you want to learn more about sludge, there's a deeper dive in Lagoon University. It's called uh, Lagoon Management and Maintenance. Sludge judging is discussed in that presentation, a whole bunch of different things. We're going to keep moving, though. We're going to go to another book. We're going to talk next about our, our friends, the protozoa. Uh, so these guys balance heterotrophic bacteria populations by eating bacteria. They're consuming organic matter. They're reducing turbidity. Your, afflu your affluent is clearer and cleaner, and they're doing that by lowering BOD and TSS. But there's not a whole lot of them out in your ponds. You're, you're only going to find about 4% of the microbial population being protozoa, according to wateroperator.org. And most common types are amoeba, flagellates, and ciliates. Uh, ciliates can be free swimming or crawling, and control of pathogens, again, E. coli, fecal coliform, these are bugs that are floating around in the water column. They're, they're food. They're food to Mr. Protozoa there. And under the right conditions, and this isn't a good news bullet, this is a bad news bullet. Under the right conditions, protozoas, they, they prefer to feed on green algae. And in doing so, they can actually trigger a blue-green algae or a cyanobacteria bloom. And I've got a quick note for the audience here on, on blue-green algae. Uh, if you see it, don't touch it with your bare hands, please. Uh, the organism creates a toxin that easily transfers to skin and can cause problems up to death. And folks, there are lots and lots of examples out there of farm ponds with a ring of dead cattle around them, subdivision ponds that kill pets, kill people's dogs. Cyanobacteria is no joke. Be very careful when you're around it. And cyanobacteria is considered a form of algae, and we're talking about algae, and that's, that's where we're heading now, is deeper into the algae conversation. So first question I have here is algae BOD, is algae biochemical oxygen demand? The answer is yes. And the answer is coming from, from our, uh, our, our good friend, Dr. Linville Rich, uh, true luminary in the industry and you know, very much missed. Uh, definitely, a, definitely a guy who uh, I, I feel confident saying he's forgotten more about wastewater treatment than most of us are ever gonna know. 
But Dr. Rich, and folks, if by the way, if you do school group tours, I encourage you, print this one out, post it, share it with the school groups. Let them know that most of the TSS and BOD and the effluent is caused by algae in the lagoon, and that very little, if any of it, is, is the residual of the stuff that came in. The school kids are probably still going to go, ew, when you tell them this, but it's a great thing to tell them. That's not, that's not the poo anymore. That's the leftover from the stuff that consumed the poo for us. Please tell the school groups, help them, help them understand a little better. So this algae stuff, it's a microscopic plant. It requires light for photosynthesis, it can be single cell or multi-cell. It can move on its own or be, uh, be subject to the whims of the currents in the water. And I think this is really fascinating. At night, it shifts from producing oxygen to consuming it. Folks, if you look at your effluent and it's really, really green, I want you to go out and check your, uh, check your effluent structure. Algae thrives in the top 15 to 18 inches of the water column, but if your effluent structure is in the top three feet, if you're drawing off of the top three feet of your final cell, it's not at all uncommon to see a lot of algae in your effluent. Requires CO2 and bicarbonate to grow and produce, and major contributors to the global, global carbon and nitrogen cycles. And looking at different types and discussing different types, we see green algae. It's a green appearance. It's generally beneficial. And in a facultative pond, it represents a lot of the oxygen transfer, other than across the liquid air interface and wind energy across the surface of the pond. Algae in a facultative pond indicates a, a green algae indicates a healthy pond. Blue green algae is a little different story, and we're going to talk more on that in a minute here. But you know, filamentous in nature, it's caused by low pH and elevated nutrients, and it can survive while the higher animal forms, those protozoa we talked about, are chewing up the green algae. And generally speaking, if you've got blue green algae, if you've got cyanobacteria, it indicates a pond with issues. And PSB is a whole nother story. That, that would take us a long, long time, so we're not going to get there today. But instead, we're going to take a look at something really neat that the state of Minnesota does. The, the imagery on the right is uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. They have these discharge windows. You can see algae rising and falling. It's that green dash line. They set up operationally to discharge when algae is low. It makes great, great sense. And it means that they don't have all their operators in the state of Minnesota running around talking about things like triploid carp and copper sulfate and things like that. And folks, that bottom bullet there, I, I've, got some, I've got some news for you here. There is a uh, very recently published paper, uh, close to 30 authors, a whole, whole bunch of PhDs wrote this thing. And winter algae turns out to be real. It's not just, it's, it's not just uh, anecdotal. Uh, algae does have the ability to grow under ice on ponds, and they've got examples from, from North America. The vast majority of them are in the northern U.S. and some into Canada, but some, some down, down moving south also. Winter algae turns out to be very real. And we're going we're gonna to take a look at some cyanobacteria, some blue-green algae here, and that's me on the dumb end of the shovel. We'll see if we can get this to play for us now. So filamentous in nature, it's almost like a handful of cotton balls. Notice I'm wearing a glove to protect myself from the toxins in there. It, it's squishy, it's stringy, it, it feels, truly, it feels like a handful of cotton balls squishing between my fingers. And over on the right side of that slide, you can see the pond. So these folks have a tertiary treatment process that was bypassed, which resulted in all of the ammonia in their effluent landing in this stagnant pond. No moving water, no aeration in that pond. Beautiful summer days, and it set the stage. And we saw this gigantic cyanobacteria bloom. The valving was corrected, the system was put back in line, and interestingly enough, in a matter of days, a couple of weeks, uh, we were back to clear water. So a great story about the food web and how if you disrupt it, you get different, different results. And folks, the conditions that promote algal growth, we've been talking about this. It's warm water, warm temperatures, sunlight, a high nutrient content, content, and insufficient mixing. And if you Google this search string, if you Google BOD5, EPA, algae, what you'll find is this fact sheet. And Steve Harris ran, ran a sample through the lab, 100 milligrams per liter of BOD. 
They apply some sleepy dust, they knock the algae out, and they test it again, and now it's only six milligrams of BOD. There's a big, big difference between 100 milligrams per liter and six milligrams per liter. And I can tell you which one I'd rather see in, in my effluent if I was operating a system. And folks, we're gonna talk about some higher life forms next, the, the big bad bugs that are eating all the other stuff in the pond. So we're, we're looking at organisms that eat bacteria and protozoa, they keep the algae in check, they help clarify the water, they're usually multicellular. We're gonna look at rotifers and Daphne, and I'm gonna talk about a, a mystery guest under behind door number three also. So what's in the pond? Uh, over on the right-hand side, there's a picture of Daphne. Uh, Ryan Hennessy does a great job profiling different bugs for TPL Magazine. I recommend checking out some of his articles. And this was his bug of the month back in October of 2001. It's a metazoa. It's one of the simplest multicellular organisms out there, and there are about 2,000 species. Some swim, others crawl, and in activated sludge, these guys contribute to the process of flocculation. They secrete a little bit of mucus from their mouth and their foot as they're chewing on an organic something. They stick to it, sticks to it, the, the mucus sticks to it. That organic something bangs into another organic something and another one. And this is how flock is formed. And really quick, we're seeing a settling velocity. Instead of being a meter a year, maybe it's a meter a month now, and we can actually settle some solids. Rotifers help with it. They do prey mainly on algae and some of the pathogens in ponds. And I think this is a crazy fact here. The majority of rotifers you see under the microscope are females. The males are really, really small and they don't last long. They don't stick around long. So if you're seeing rotifers, you're gonna see less turbidity, clearer effluent, but you're also gonna be able to watch them. And if you're seeing some toxicity showing up in your pond, it's very probably uh, gonna, gonna kill the rotifers first. They're a leading organism. They're an indicating organism for that. And they're very, very valuable. And folks, I've been talking give or take for 47 minutes at this point. I'm gonna grab a drink of water here. I'm gonna play a video for about 18 seconds. This is research out of Krakow, Poland. And I'm gonna apologize in advance for the music. It was not my choosing. But here's rotifers. Here's a rotifer eating filamentous bacteria. Hey there, Delilah, what's it like in New York City? And that was a ro that was a rotifer eating eating filamentous bacteria that we just saw. We're switching to Daphne now. They're plankton planktonic crustaceans. Hold on a second. They're a crustacean. What else is a crustacean? Lobsters are crustaceans. Crab, shrimp, they're crustaceans. These are their cousins. These guys are also known as water fleas. And crustacean just means that they've got a hard exoskeleton. They've got their skeleton on the outside of the body. Then everything's all squishy on the inside. There's over a hundred known species and these organisms are filter feeders. That means they take a mass of water in, there are nutrient particles in that water and they filter that out. They filter the nutrients out as they expel the water. They're found just about everywhere on earth except for Antarctica. Six and a half to nine and a half is their pH range, but they're a lot happier at eight, at seven, two to eight, five. And this little factoid out of the National Institute of Health, I think is wild. Looking at the food web and thinking about them growing and shrinking in, in prevalence and presence, up to seven orders of magnitude of difference in a single season, according to NIH. And they don't last very long. These aren't long living organisms. And at 20C, that little tiny heart of theirs is beating over 200 times a minute. It's not hard to imagine why they, why they aren't real hardy, long lived organisms. What they are though is an indica indicator organism and they're inherently transparent. Center photo on the right hand side, there's a transparent Daphne organism. They get, if they're exposed to low food conditions, low DO, they get stressed. The hemoglobin that they use for O2 concentrate can vary up to 20X. And we see red, red streaks or pink streaks in the ponds. Now, if you're just seeing red dots in the ponds, that's probably individual organisms that are, that are affected, infected with parasites. And generally speaking, the parasitic infections aren't, aren't broad enough to exhibit the streaking that you see in the photo on the right. That's more typically a, a low DO uh, kind of situation, stressing the Daphne and turning them red. And folks, they're sensitive to ammonia. There's a study out of Spain that determined 50% inactivation. That's half of the Daphnia just 
whacked. They're not doing anything. They're either dead or they're ineffective. And that's given just seven days exposure to uh, six or more parts of nitrite and 40 or more parts of ammonium. And you can whack those daphnia. And we're ready for the, uh, the mystery guest behind door number three. It's everybody's favorite wastewater microorganism to talk about, the tardigrade. There's about 1,300 species of these guys, but only a few of them are found in wastewater lagoons. And I love this descriptive term, extremophile. These things survive in environments that'll kill almost everything. According to Nat Geo, they can go up to about 30 years without food, live at or near absolute zero and or boiling, and survive pressures six times the pressure in the deepest ocean trench or the vacuum of space. These guys have a, a little water covering on their body. They're, they're a, a water bear. And uh, you know, absent that water covering, they curl up in a little ball and they wait until they're wet again to, to come back to life, if you will, to reanimate. The American Museum of Natural History says they're about 600 years old. And I've got a, a, neat, a neat depiction of one on the right there. And then center is some, some of the finest that you can find on Facebook. And look at that little guy playing his violin. You just don't see that every day when you when you look at tardigrades, do you? And folks, we're going to change gears again. We're going to switch over and talk respiration and fermentation next. So it's a very basic fact of life. Carbon and energy are needed to sustain the microbiology in our ponds. They're needed to sustain us. For those microbes in the ponds, BOD equals carbon. For us, it's Big Macs. Lower life forms that they eat, they represent carbon and energy also. They're like Big Macs to the bugs. So the, the bad kids now, the methogenins, the methane producing bugs, those guys, here's some examples. They're using CO2 for carbon, hydrogen for energy. Autotrophic nitrifiers are using CO2 for carbon and ammonium or nitrate, either NH4 or NO2 uh, for energy. And then autotrophic algae use CO2 and sunlight via photosynthesis. And that's how they are creating their energy. I've got a nice quote from uh, Michael Girardi here that cellular respiration or fermentation is the degradation of the substrate, soluble carbonaceous BOD or SCBOD, in order to obtain energy for cellular activity and reproduction. And really and truly, cellular activity and reproduction are the two things that these microorganisms do. They don't give presentations or webinars. They're, they're not worried about what kind of job they're going to get after college. All they're doing is, is, is eating and reproducing. And that's it. So respiration is an aerobic thing. You've got oxygen present. You see a complete breakdown of the substrate to glucose, uh, the substrate, the glucose. Fermentation is a different pro process and it's slower and it's less efficient and it's anaerobic. That anaerobic energy production uses glucose as a reactant. And we see an incomplete breakdown of the substrate. There's no oxygen available. And they both create energy in, in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And folks, this quote has, out of Sweden, this has nothing to do with us human beings. It has everything to do with microorganisms. Excuse me, that has everything to do with human beings and nothing to do with microorganisms. Any given day, you turn over your body weight. Your body, the cells in your body, has to produce your body weight equivalent in ATP to keep going. It's the principal energy currency of the cell. And ATP, we're looking at a little bit more closely now. We see a molecule on the right. It was the University of Bristol's molecule of the month back in January of 98. I'll let you in on a secret. At some point in time, everyone that has a molecule of the month makes it ATP. I like the University of Bristol's drawing the best, and I think it looks the best on the slide, so I grabbed theirs. You've got high potential energy, the base, the ribose, and the phosphate. You see them left to right there. And yeah, ribose plus base is adenosine. ATP is going to lose a phosphate when prompted enzymatically. The enzyme, the, the microorganism that possesses the ATP releases an enzyme that triggers the release of that last phosphate on the chain. And after that reaction, you're left with ADP. And I think it's important to note that cells are only storing enough energy for 30 seconds up to a couple of minutes of normal activity. That goes a long way towards explaining the quote from Sweden at the bottom of the last page, I think. We're going to dig a little deeper into respiration fermentation here, and we're going to look at a reaction. So electron transfer is the mechanism used to harvest energy, and it's in respiration, we've got an electron donor and an electron acceptor. 
we see glucose plus oxygen breaks down to CO2 and water in the uh, in the respiration example, and that yields 36 ATP molecules. Fermentation is there next, and we see less energy produced as glucose breaks down into lactic acid. And as a result, we only see two ATP molecules. Now, I do think it's important to note that this is theoretical, and in the real world, there are plenty of mitigating factors that prevent the reaction from exhaustively completing. So it may be 30 or 28 ATPs. It may not be 36. 36 and two were the theoretical numbers, and that's a big, big difference. And folks, we're, we're about to hit the, uh, the last section here. We're going to hit review, and we're going to talk about these critical five, the five critical factors for lagoon performance. I like to think of them as legs holding up a table. Without each leg being of the correct proportion, my nice glass of single malt scotch is going to slide right off of that table, and we don't want that to happen. So we've, we've got to keep these parameters in mind when we're assessing how a system's performing. And we'll start this discussion with DO. It's probably the most basic of the building blocks for treatment. I interestingly enough, the different states out there have different opinions on how much DO is required to oxidize contaminants. And they range from about 1.2 pounds of oxygen per pound of VOD up to two pounds. As we talked earlier, nitrification is pretty well understood. Uh, you're going to see little to no DO arriving from collection, so it's got to be created in the pond. Uh, facultative ponds are dependent on wind energy, algal activity. That's how they transfer oxygen to the water. Aerated ponds, you've got aerators of some sort, blower, surface aerators, diffusers. Depends on your system. And increasing air is an easy lever to pull, but you got to look at all five factors before you just jump to it, or you're going to find yourself spending money needlessly and possibly not, cre not creating an actual solution to the problem. Over on the left, temperature impacts DO, and we can see that the colder the water is, the higher the saturation of oxygen that we can, we can achieve. Neat quote here from our friend Steve Harris, water temperature predictor, reliable predictor of water quality, can aid the operator in preparing for changes in pond performance. I was talking to an operator at a conference, uh, I don't know, 30, 60 days ago, and he was telling me that he's seeing about 72 Fahrenheit in the top of his lagoon right now, so he knows that he's going to see a seasonal turnover in the next two weeks. That gentleman understands temperature, and he's, he's using that to help him understand how his pond's performing. Temperature can cause stratification. If you form a thermocline, that can help to short circuit, reduce treatment time. You see less treatment occurring because every 10 degree reduction in temperature is reducing microbial activity. So EPA understands this and they have a size larger in northern climates, knowing that in the wintertime you'll see a reduction in treatment. Ice covering the lagoon surface, a facultative pond, you're not going to see the surface, of, surface transfer of oxygen across the liquid air interface. And phosphorus removal, you, you can drop from 50% to 35% just depending on the temperature of the weather. You'll accumulate more sludge if you're not getting the good treatment, that stands to reason, and nitrification has temperature limited. And then, uh, you know, temperature promotes conditions for spring lagoon turnover via thermocline formation, if you have a facultative pond. And temperature is important for nitrification also. Nitrifiers are temperature sensitive, and there's this whole body of literature and research out there that would suggest that nitrification slows and stops at about four and a half degrees Celsius. It doesn't. Go check out our presentation, Nitrification in Cold Weather on LagoonUniversity.com. You'll see data that continues down to half a degree Celsius. Temperature definitely slows it down, but as long as you've got bugs that are biting on it, you're, you're going to get ammonia removed. And ammonia, we talk about removing it. We don't talk about it very often as a crucial building block for cellular structures. It's used by bacteria to make proteins and enzymes, and it's in BOD destruction, and the various forms are there. I've just got a quick note here. Organic nitrogen is locked up in microorganisms via assimilation. As those bugs die and fall to the bottom of the pond, that nitrogen can be re-released. It can be fed back. That's referred to very specifically as benthal feedback. So ammonia, it's something we're trying to get out of the water and something that we need in the water at the same time. Ditto on phosphorus, it's a building block of life. Bacteria and algae both use it to build their cellular structures. Its most common form is phosphate. 
too much of it can lead to an explosive growth of uh, aquatic plants and algae. And algae blooms are something we definitely don't want. EPA refers to it as a limiting nutrient because if you don't have enough, you don't grow all the algae or plants you should. And the phosphorus cycle, much like, much like algae, this is a geochemical, biogeochemical. This is worldwide. Key component of ATP also. And next up, we're going to talk about the fifth and final of these. We're going to talk about pH. We discussed this a lot earlier. And the key takeaway here, pH is going to change over time. Algae is consuming CO2. It's normalizing the pH. pH conversion of ammonia above about 9.4. Almost all of that ammonia gets converted to ammonia. And then pH is not equal to alkalinity. I've got the forms of alkalinity there again as a reminder for everyone. And folks, when you're measuring pH, there's a good way to do it. And, you know, that would be using something like a handheld meter, like you see on the screen there. A better way would be going bench top, and you've got three calibration solutions available, and you're actually doing a multi-point calibration on your system. And, you know, Ben's opinion is that it's hard to beat titration chemistry, and, and that's a great way to ensure that you really and truly know what you have for a pH. But the last one that I have for you, it, it's just no. Do please, please, please do not use those test strips. They're not accurate at all. Folks, that's the end of my slides. I've got a, I've got a reminder here that if you'll type any questions that you have over in the uh, block on the right, if time allows now, we're going to answer some questions. If time doesn't, we're going to be responding via email. And the Slide on the screen now, Laguniversity. Uh, Laguniversity.com is 100% free. There's a number of different webinars available. If you're behind on PDHs and CEUs, I'd encourage you to check it out. There's probably some valuable content there. Do take a look first, though, to make sure that whatever uh, you're clicking into is going to give you a PDH or CEU in your, in your uh, state where your license is registered. Folks, it's time to open up for some Q&A. All right, Ben, here's the first one. Um, when you were talking about nitrification, you said it requires a carbon source. Can you talk a little bit about what carbon sources are? Yeah, so carbon source is just, it's that very basic building block. Um, it's, it's what the organism is going to use to create its cell walls, its cell structure, the bits and pieces of structure inside of the microorganism. And the BOD that's most typically used is the BOD that's arriving from the collection system. What's coming in in a municipality is typically two, 250 milligrams per liter. And it's really, it's high in organics. It's really, really soluble. And the bioavailability to the microorganism is incredibly high. When we start to talk about denitrification and tertiary treatment, the, uh, the industry has one molecule that, that we all seem to favor. Uh, it's a product called Micro-C, and it's an artificial carbon source, and it gets fed downstream in order to uh, facilitate the growth of the heterotrophic bacteria that denitrify. So carbon is important in the, to all processes in the lagoons, all bugs in the lagoons. Every microorganism out there needs some amount of it in order to build their cellular structure. All right, Ben, this one might be for our process engineers, but I'll give it a shot. Um, so uh, this person has experienced twice in the last year, once in the summer and once in the winter, chlorine sponge or not enough residual chlorine at the end of the system. Uh, do you know what would be causing that? Yeah, that, that's one that we do need to kick over to the process team. Um, if, if that caller can please, uh, my email's on the screen, please send me uh, just a statement of the problem as you understand it. I'd like to, I'd like to know what's going on, what else could be could be taking place that's causing that. Chlorination is typically done at the end of the process, and you just add until you've got a residual, and then you dechlorinate so that you're not releasing that to the uh, to the environment. The idea is that you're disinfecting the wastewater. You're getting rid of fecal coliform, E. coli, some other some other nasty constituents in there. And uh, chlorine is a powerful oxidizer. Uh, you oxidize the bacteria, and then you dechlorinate to neutralize in order to be able to safe to release to the environment. Um, all right, we're almost out of time. We'll make this the last one. 
Um, is aeration in lagoons the solution to avoid having to transition to a mechanical plant? Boy, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, aeration is a great, great lever to pull. And when you think about how a lagoon is set up, you've got a, a, a hydraulic retention time and you've got treatment that's tied to it. Treatment time equals HRT in most instances. And if you can do something to either speed up the treatment or extend the HRT, that will give you the ability to use that same existing infrastructure and get more out of it. So yeah, if you're, if you're somehow being limited with your lagoon system and you're starting to reach uh, theoretical maximum processing, it may be that a different treatment kinetic stepping up from facultative to partial mix, from partial mix to a vigorous mix or vigorous mix into a complete mix environment. That could absolutely be how you get more biological activity. Because if you provide enough air, you grow the bugs to eat. If you provide enough air and you've got enough food source, the bugs are going to grow to, they're going to grow, they're going to expand to meet that need. And that's how you absolutely adding air is how you get a, get a pond to do more as far as treatment. All right, then we're about out of time, so we will answer these other questions offline. Thank you everyone so much for attending today.